Good afternoon. It is 12.41 p.m. on Sunday, October 16th, 2016. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I didn't just get up. I've been up for a while. This is five more minutes. So, recording later than usual today for a variety of reasons. One is that, uh, although I did sleep in, um, my recording of the video was delayed by my computer arbitrarily, well, probably not really arbitrarily, um, deciding to do an hour's worth of system updates before it would boot up. That was annoying. Um, but, you know, these things happen. And then, while I was waiting for that, um, I called my mom, and then we talked for a while. So, I've been up for a little bit. But, now it is time, as I do every Sunday, to talk about the next episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. This is episode eight. Oh, I need to do better at tracking these numbers. Uh, the <laughs> I know which one it is. It is part two of the Winter Solstice two-parter, Avatar Roku. Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so yes, it was episode eight. So. This episode, I think, is fantastic, and it does a lot of things uh, that are important. One of them is to establish firmly what the series-level threat is. Not even just the immediate threat, but the series-level. Like, what is the overall objective here? And also establishes a timeline that in a neat bit of storytelling is way more accelerated than we probably would have predicted. Uh, so now, after this episode, we know that the whole goal here is that Fire Lord Ozai is waiting for the um, this new comet to come back around again, which gives all the firebenders superpowers, essentially, even beyond their normal firebending, and would essentially allow him to definitively take over the world. As opposed to this ongoing war, he's going to just basically eliminate all remaining resistance or um, opposition. So not good. And then worse, this comet's coming in just three months, by summer's end. So that's not great, because before that can happen... Aang still needs to learn how to water bend, earth bend, and oh, excuse me, and fire bend, um, in order to be a fully empowered avatar, which is what is necessary to defeat uh, Fire Lord Ozai, and that's that's how the whole thing is uh, presented, and so that's great stuff to establish that, um, because these some of these early episodes lacked some of that urgency. Um, that's not a criticism, but it's just because we're expanding and we're defining the world. But now we see there's no time to waste here. We got stuff to do. Uh, but then I also think that this episode is really strong in a number of other ways of some action um, and also uh, just suspense and pacing. Uh, we get a couple of things going on. We, we also start getting our first callbacks to earlier episodes. So, just as soon as we have Aang, Katara, and Sokka leaving uh, to go to this Fire Nation island where the Fire Temple is, just as soon as they're leaving, uh, Zuko has tracked them there, and so he now knows where they're going to. And I feel like it's a little... The only thing that's maybe fudged a little bit is that it's not clear the relative speeds of one of Zuko's Fire Nation ship versus Appa flying. I think my instinct would be to say that Appa flying seems like it would be much faster, but I suppose Appa is an animal and therefore, you know, he's going to get tired. He can't necessarily fly at the same speed all day, whereas the ship, as long as it's got enough fuel, can just keep going full steam ahead all day. But in any case, um, we're on our way, uh, but Zuko is chasing behind, and then we discover there's a Fire Nation blockade. And so we get this exciting sequence of um, 
them they're launching these giant uh like rocks covered with flaming oil uh into the sky with catapults and uh this episode is in a couple places does things where that are kind of neat where you think of something that could potentially be done and then the episode points out you know wh what the problem is with that so like for example they, uh, Ang and company, initially tried to avoid these fireballs by flying way up high uh, above the cloud cover. But what they discover then is the problem now is that they can't see the fireballs coming. So they just keep erupting from under the clouds in unexpected places as opposed to when they were lower and they could sort of see which ones were likely to be approaching. And so then they actually re re tool their plan and then they go way low because they're harder to target that way. Um, and so that's, uh, that gets them through. But what we also have in the continuing interest of spending a lot more time on the relationship with Zuko and Iroh than, uh, you would normally expect for a typical kids show, spending time on the bad guys, the bad guys, is that this this blockade is is run by Commander Zhao, um, who who Zuko fought with in the earlier episode. And uh, so we also know, and it's Iroh is is really advising Zuko, even though you're pursuing the Avatar, if you sail into Fire Nation waters, you could be arrested, because you were banished. And even though you've decided that capturing the Avatar would be the way to restore your honor you're still not allowed in the Fire Nation territory. And um, Zuko is like, my father will understand it's because I'm going after the Avatar. And Iroh is like, you give him too much credit. He's my brother. I don't think he, he's not the understanding type. And so we have Zuko under a lot of the same pressure that Aang and the other kids are because he knows that he's basically saying, okay, I am, I'm betting it all. I'm all in on this because I'm going to be arrested for going into this territory. So if I don't catch, catch the avatar, then I could be in serious trouble. And, uh, so then we, we discover some more nuance where the fire sages, the people who run this fire nation temple, in theory, are supposed to be loyal to the Avatar, but it's been a hundred years, and they're in the Fire Nation territory, and so basically the Fire Lord has told them, nope, you are loyal to me now, and it's been a hundred years of that. So a lot of them just, you know, not only are, like, maybe their grandparents were the ones persuaded, but now they've grown up, nope, that's just how it is. You are not loyal to the Avatar, you are loyal to the Fire Nation. But one of the sages remembers, and so he's able to lead uh, everybody to where they need to go, and it's, it's, it's exciting. And then we get the cool uh, Fire Nation equivalent of the door to the Air Temple Sanctuary, the one that Aang was able to open because he isn't Master Airbender, but he doesn't know how to firebend yet, and so he cannot open the equivalent Fire Nation door. And then we get an interesting... Here's where we get a sequence that I think is really exemplary of the quality of this show and just the complexity of it. One is that Sokka gets a good idea to try to improvise some explosives to mimic the firebending and maybe open the door. And it's portrayed as a great idea, and it is certainly a great idea to try, but it's all kind of these stacking things, is that it may or may not work, but it will definitely make a noise that will alert the fire sages to know where they are. And so then it's like, okay, so let's try that. Okay, but then it didn't work. And that's frustrating because we feel like it should have worked. Why didn't it work? And we can say, okay, I guess it's just, that's not actually how it works. It's disappointing, but it left enough scorch marks that maybe we can try a, a, a new trick. And the new trick is it looks like it worked. So if we hide, the Fire Nation will think we opened the door and they'll try opening it in order to follow us. And so that starts to work 
But then, just as they've got the door open and Aang needs to run in, Zuko shows up and he's got Aang pinned. Uh-oh, what are we doing now? But then, turns out, Zuko's little decoy with the smoke trail didn't work and now Commander Zhao's here to arrest everybody. But then finally Aang does make, you know, he wrestles himself free and he manages to get in through the door. So the door closes behind him and they can't open it. So now we get these dual scenes of Commander Zhao who's got everybody prisoner, including Katara and Sokka and Zuko, and it's not a good scene, man. And then we've got Aang finally able to talk to Avatar Roku, which is great, but... Roku's got bad news, and it's this whole deal about the comet and the timeline. It's not great. It, so there's bad news on all fronts. Plus, now, coming out, Aang's still going to have to come. He has to find a way to rescue Katara and Sokka. He has to get away free. But it turns out, the last lingering bit of the daylight of the solstice, Avatar Roku... Uh, we, we've seen Aang enter the Avatar state before in the initial two-parter um, where he is super powerful in that state but also seems like he's not kind of fully in control. It's more like his Avatar nature is takes over for a while. And in this case, what we discover is that while in this, in this place on this day, that allows Avatar Roku to step in with his master firebending. And so he takes out all of the soldiers, frees everybody, and decides this temple has not, you know, kept its uh, promise. It's not fulfilled its duty. And so he's going to tear the whole temple down around. And then meanwhile, we get Aang, Katara, and Sokka manage to escape on Appa through the window. And then Zuko gets away in the chaos. And so now... We're in some ways back to the status quo. You know, Aang is going to still be headed for the North Pole to learn water bending. Zuko is still after him. But now we know the stakes. And that's why this episode is great. So um, next time uh, we're going to be talking about uh, episode nine, the water bending scroll. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow for five more minutes.